thank you for coming to join us. Can you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Debbie Lawler, I'm a Professor of Epidemiology from the MRC Integrative Epidemiology Unit at the University of Bristol. Thank you. And can you tell us when you got first got interested in public health? Yeah, I I would say when I I started out in clinical practice and imagined that's what I would always do and and had also been very keen to go and work in one of the frontline states. So I was very involved in anti apartheid politics as a student. And so I went to work in Mozambique doing child and maternal health. And I think at that stage I had no real plans about when I would come home or whatever. But what was striking there was how, and, and this was when the Civil War was still on, how limited clinical medicine was in some ways, hugely because of the war, but also because of the extreme poverty. And there were some incredible things, some things that you know really stood out, like delivering triplets who were very premature and thinking there's no way they will survive. And the mother just did this technique called kangarooing them, and she was six months um, in the hospital with these three strapped to her breast and breastfed them, and we kept her well-nourished, and they survived and were well. But there was a lot of extreme malnutrition and they could be treated with a mixture of oil, milk and sugar and get better and, and you know, their malaria treat and all the rest. But they were clearly going back into the environment that brought them here in the first place. And so when I did then come back to England, I was much more aware of that same sort of issue. So I was working in general practice and doing some community obstetrics in Bradford, which is where I was from originally, and noticed some of the similar things. Some of the things I was seeing were had treatment elements to them, but were due to the sort of situations that people found themselves in. So that was when I started thinking about, and, and I guess also a natural curiosity. I was interested in doing research and and the two, you know, and doing research not in a laboratory setting. Um, so the two came together around that time. Great. Okay, so can you tell us what you see as the biggest public health challenge today? Yeah, I guess it, it sort of, um, sadly, is maybe similar to what I felt when I first started. So I think the big public health challenges are not areas I particularly working. But they are war and refugees and displacement, climate change, the, the sort of huge threats that I think people try and underplay that are worrying, certainly for the next generations, that have some solutions but we don't quite know what to do. Um, I, it, it sounds when I sort of say that, it sounds a bit like Miss World, I want world peace kind of thing. Um, and is it realistic? Just going back to Mozambique, um, there was a really emotional day for me and other people two weeks ago when the last landmine in Mozambique was cleared. So this is, you know, well over 20 years since peace and the country's still been blighted by the effects of landmines. But, and, and I guess also these big things, you know, I never thought Nelson Mandela would be freed. I never thought we'd have peace in Northern Ireland. Never thought apartheid would stop. There were times when you didn't think the war would stop in the frontline states, but they did, and though there are still problems in those countries, they're thriving, that the sort of last legacy of the war in Mozambique has now been cleared, that, that landmines are, are largely banned around the world. It is possible to make big changes, it takes time, but there are examples where it's possible, so, yeah. I'm going to be naughty and go off script for a moment, because you've taken this in an interesting direction. Okay. Um, <laughs> The, the challenges you've described are things that are not traditionally perceived as public health issues. To what degree do you think public health academics can be activists for broader change? I think, I think you're right. And I struggle sometimes with um, the work that is done in public health highlighting the health effects of these things as if you know, if it weren't for the health effects of, for example, inequality, 
then that inequality wouldn't matter if it wasn't for the health effects of climate change or, or war and refugee status then those things wouldn't matter to me they matter almost irrespective of their health yeah. effect but people I guess the reason that we still feel it important to highlight those things is that people care about their health and they care about their children's health and and I think sometimes the, the health effects are underestimated. The whole sort of, you know, people were not surprisingly moved by the photo of a boy at the edge of the sea. Right? But, you know, you just step back and you try to imagine what it must be like for you, for your psychological health, for your physical health, if things were so bad in your home, the way you have a home, and you had to walk miles and miles and miles. You had to put your children on a boat where they may not survive, where you may not survive, and then walk miles and miles and miles again. And I, I don't, you know, so I think there, if we're prepared to work together, there have to be solutions. I think it's beyond public health, but I think we have a part in highlighting what the issues are, what they mean for humans and for populations, and thinking about ways in in which we can potentially change things. And I guess there are sort of, you know, Anthony McMichael was an example of somebody who was talking about climate change and working in climate change and explaining the complexity and the public health effects of climate change for a long time. And, and people, um, you know, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine who are still doing the same. So I think there is a role, but it's also bigger than just public health. Brilliant. We'll go back to the script now. So one of your expertise is around life course epidemiology. Could you tell us what that means? So it can sort of sound like a sort of, well, it's just everything. Um, so a sort of formal definition is it's about understanding the, the social, the behavioural, biological effects on health and well-being from conception, potentially even from generations earlier, so from your grandparents, through to adulthood. And so you can put everything within a life course framework, and that's potentially good because that's a unifying theme when I think we should be increasingly working in a more disciplinary way. Um, but I think it's not, you know, if you look at an exposure in childhood with an outcome a few years later, it's not necessarily in a life course mm. framework and and it's more in analytical terms trying to understand when the best times may be to intervene. So if I think of an example in the area that I work in, there's a huge amount of interest in sort of broadly termed developmental origins that Things that women do during their pregnancy or exposures that they are, things that they're exposed to during their pregnancy, have a lasting effect on the health of their children. And that belief is beginning to have an effect on policy. So things like the recent change in how gestational diabetes is diagnosed, which is shifted from an emphasis on trying to identify women at risk of type 2 diabetes to trying to prevent obesity and cardiometabolic health in the child as they grow and the American sort of guidelines about restricting weight gain in pregnancy again with the same aim but actually with really poor evidence that there will be that effect and for me the sort of life course perspective is saying it's important to try and get the best evidence we can about whether where you put the thresholds for dying, diagnosing gestational diabetes, whether you can, and if you could, whether you restrict weight gain during pregnancy, what are the broad range of health effects that has on mother and child. And then it sort of needs to be put together with, and, and if there are causal effects and they're important, is that the best time to intervene? Is that where you get sort of most health benefit for the cost it would do to intervene at that time as opposed to potentially intervening later in the life course where the exposures at that stage may interact again and have an effect. So it's that sort of trying to link those pieces together and decide what should we be doing to improve public health and where should we be doing it. And um, one of the kind of key concepts in life course epidemiology and your expert, uh, expertise is around causality. Can you just explain the importance of that in life course epidemiology? 
Yeah, I guess it goes back to what I was just saying. It's um, so we have an understanding that randomised control trials are the sort of best form of evidence for causal effects. Um, that's in the context of a well-conducted randomised control trial. When we're trying to understand what are potentially very long-term effects and effects that may have specific time periods, may change over time, it's not easy and in some cases not possible to undertake randomised control trials. So we, and we, we've known for forever that if you see an association, it may or may not be causal. And I think it's actually from a number of different angles, the attempts to try and get better causal inference from observational epidemiology have made the discipline better in terms of scrutinising some of the methods that we're more familiar with, including randomised control trials, and thinking a bit more carefully about the assumptions underlying those and, and what you know, evidence may or may not be supporting causal effects. I think having said that, and it's sort of very relevant to, to this unit where your interest is in policy, is how you get that balance between um, at any particular time is there sufficient evidence to say there's something causal? Um, wh when do you go for policy? And, and it's, you know, researchers and general epidemiologists maybe particularly must drive people mad with their kind of, well, we need more research, because often you feel that you do, whereas a policymaker may need to sort of intervene now. And I, I guess the balance has to be with, you know, when there is a need to do something, what's the best evidence now for what we should be doing and maybe a little bit more um, an open you know when I was doing clinical practice one of my mentors said you've always got to leave the door open you've got to make the person feel as they go out of the door that they can come back that this is not kind of right end of consultation end of we've diagnosed you we've treated you it's all done you've got to and I think maybe the same is needed for the sort of interaction between so by and large, policy should be based on causality. That doesn't mean you need elaborate research. I mean, some things that kind of obviously cause all the whole sort of, you know, getting people to wear their seat belts. It was obvious we didn't need to do randomised control trials or elaborate Mendelian randomisation studies. But at any one time where there's some level of uncertainty, policy has to go ahead, but you need to leave the door open and allow for change in policy as more evidence is accrued. Brilliant. I think I'm going to skip the next question, which was about developments, and ask you what piece of work or part of your career are you most proud of, and why? <laughs> Actually, I did. I sort of flipped through the questions, mm -hmm. there, and that was the one I sort of felt a bit sort of. I think it's maybe because because um, I'm from Bradford and from a. Um, a family background where nobody went to university, and, and so and I, I, to say you're proud, it's like that pride comes before a fall, it sort of implies I have done something great, when in actual fact, in, in work, I, in all the different places and things that I've done in work, I've always it, felt incredibly privileged that I'm doing a job where, yeah, there are days when you kind of wish you hadn't got out of bed, but by and large, I just find what I do is rewarding and interesting and I'm privileged to be able to do that. Um, I guess I, you know, everything is, is, again, it's in groups, it's not single person. I think some of the contribution that I've been involved in, in sort of making people think a little bit more about causality and, and getting that onto the agenda, um, I think so the recent work that I've been doing around infertility and its treatment, which is about trying to give couples a, a better understanding of the policies are the policies, but again, they may not always be based on best evidence. And, and for couples to understand, you know, just simple things like we have a paper that's being reviewed at the moment, the sort of ingrained belief and sometimes legislation and, and guidance that, you know, after three cycles, that's it. 
but nobody's ever looked at whether that's true and, and to what we've done suggests that you, you ca your likelihood of getting pregnant continues to increase with further cycles. Now, there are all sorts of implications there and I'm not saying that necessarily every couple would want to go on and have nine cycles of treatment but it's about giving people that information that's yeah, important. And then I guess sort of not related to research, I do feel proud I guess of, of my attempts at um, trying to support junior colleagues and trying in what are sometimes difficult situations, and I think I've never quite been as brave as, as, as some people, uh, of getting gender equality and diversity much more on the agenda in a way that I think there are sort of institutionalised issues. It's not that particular men are sexist, it's that they don't, the, the institution allows a, a sense of being able to say things, do things in an automated way that promote as best um, white men and, and it's, it's, you know, it's important that that kind of thing changes. Brilliant, thank you very much. She says to you about like maths. Yeah, yeah, I don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot, a lot of those conversations. <laughs> right, so time for a, a big kind of blue sky question. If you could do one thing to improve the public's health, what would it be? I guess that relates a little bit to what I was talking about earlier, big public health. But I get so a a thing now, um, and I'll put it in the context of being in this country. I think a real concerted effort to make it easy, really easy, to make it the option for people to walk, cycle, use their car less, um, but but just making it a real option, making it attractive. You know, it's there's something about you know just walking over North Bridge and you see the view and actually walking down your road and you see the view and you think, God, why wouldn't people want to walk and see that? But it's just making it all much more feasible and possible. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and final question. If you weren't in your current career, what job do you think you'd be doing? <laughs> that was another one that yeah. made me laugh a bit. I think because, um, you know, I was... Sometimes that's asked as you know, what do you want to be when you're a child? And I, I sort of don't remember. Um, the, I, what I do remember is I knew I liked school a lot. And the sort of the area I was from, the, the comprehensive went to, we didn't have a sixth one because they didn't expect anybody to need it. And most of my friends sort of left school at 16. You could go to the direct grant school if you'd done well at O levels. And so I went from a sort of then mixed sex comprehensive school to an all girls direct grand school, uh, which was very strange. And the um, headmistress kind of interviewed me. It seems very strange, that, which it, and said, "Oh, you've done very well in your O levels. Um, what are you going to do at A level?" And I'd in my head because I didn't know people who gone to university thought we do quite a few subjects at O level and then you do fewer at A level and then you do one at university and beyond that I had no idea at all and so I sort of and I thought there was a set block of things you could learn so I sort of thought I could probably do four A levels and I'd thought about it and you know my favourite ones and I, so I said oh, I want to do maths, physics, history and English literature and she said no, no, no can't do that you've got to think about what it is you're going to do at university and and sort of you know you've got to do humanities or arts or science and I was already beginning to be confused by the words she was using and then she said you're good enough to do law engineering or medicine what do you want to do and I just did this great thing of something I'm getting more and more embarrassed engineering I missed up with car mechanics so I, thought, I can't even understand why she's talking about that law I just had you know my dad's voice in my head going the fucking law so I thought I'm not do that and so I said what's medicine and she said oh you'll be a doctor um is that what you want to do very good off you go so that was how I ended up doing medicine um and I sort of reflect on that sometimes and I think just actually getting to the point um I I have no regrets at all and I've really enjoyed and continue to enjoy my work but I suppose I, I still liked the history and, and the literature and, and I guess like a lot of people, 
I love reading and I love doing sort of arts things and I sometimes think, oh, when I retire, if I retire, I might write something. Brilliant. Brilliant.